Okay. Um, so, what I want to talk to you uh, today is institutional freedom or academic freedom within institutions. And I think this quote from Sir John Russell frames the paper quite nicely. Uh, Russell, at this point, was the director of the Rothamsted Research Institute, one of the preeminent agricultural research institutes in Britain. Um, and he was speaking to the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And Russell gives his own historical periodization of agricultural research in Britain, um, and it's a four-period history, and this is him just speaking to the very first period, which he calls uh, a period of free exploration since workers were not usually tied down to any particular technical problem. Um, and his reasons for making this historical argument become clear as he concluded the paper by saying, the safest way of making advances, even for purely practical purposes, is to leave the investigator unfettered. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking to exactly an investigator who felt himself to be very much fettered. Um, and it's worth pointing out that Russell actually goes on to write the history of agricultural science in Britain. Um, so this is a thoroughgoing historical interest in his career, although I'm not going to come back to that. Um, and in terms of methodology, um, I'm going to embarrass Barbara by quoting her to herself. Um, and this is from her 2006 JHB paper on uh, Blakesley. And um, I think it speaks to something that all the papers are doing today, um, looking to connections and differences. Um, and I very much want to emphasize that um, researchers, as they moved from place to place, um, didn't just move within national contexts. They also moved within international contexts. And so I'm going to be looking today at um, the differences and connections between the British national context and the New Zealand national context. Um, and it's to try and ameliorate uh, some of the abuses of geography, let's say, which have been prevalent in the history of genetics so far. So there's a tendency to move from Britain very sharply in around 1914 to America and uh, Morgan's fly room, and then come back to Britain again. Um, as though there were no prior history to the American developments and the English ones kind of temporarily disappeared for a while. Um, okay, so how I'm going to cash that out is by giving you a little bit of context on the uh, British and New Zealand wheat industries. And the wheat industry, um, both national and international, is really something that frames all three papers in this session. Um, before looking at Otto Frankel, um, a Viennese intellectual who found himself jettisoned into Frontiers Town uh, Christchurch in New Zealand, um, with some interesting consequences. And then we're going to have a look at uh, Frankel's breeding program in New Zealand, um, which was an incredibly successful one, but an incredibly unhappy one for him. Okay, so um, this is the British wheat industry. Um, I don't want you to take very much away from that, and I'm not going to pretend to do any econometrics now, um, although they remain to be done. But the thing to notice here is the black line, which represents acreage. Um, and the thing to notice about the black line is just how much volatility there is in acreage and production, which seems to roughly track acreage. Um, this is the New Zealand wheat industry. Um, people just don't make tables like this anymore. Um, and once again, the black bars are showing yield, and once again, you can see the massive amounts of volatility going on here. Um, both of these graphs run from around the 1860s through to the 1960s for the British one, and 1940 for the Kiwi one. And you can see the First World War comes in just about here. Um, and this volatility within the wheat market provided a problem which Mendelians very often claim to be able to ameliorate. Um, and so here we can see Frederick Hilgendorf, who was a professor at the University of Canterbury, not that Canterbury, the one in New Zealand. Um, and he's speaking um, in a popular publication, the New Zealand Evening Post, and he points out during the war years, or five years before the war, we were on the verge of not growing enough to feed our own population. And these themes of national security and food security are very prevalent in both the British case and in the New Zealand case. Um, and that's not a coincidence, because there are some very strong connections here. So in both situations, you have these periods of boom and bust and volatility, 
And in both countries, the answer was approximately the same, government intervention. So in both countries, fixed prices for wheat were introduced at certain points and then taken away again. And in both countries, money was made available for institutionalised plant breeding. Um, however, there were some differences between the New Zealand and the British cases. Um, so here we see the Kiwi view of what was happening in Britain in this period. Um, and this is from uh, the preeminent trade journal of the wheat industry in New Zealand, the Wheat Grower. And they looked with some suspicion at uh, exactly the events which Don has just been describing, the establishment of a national institute, um, which they took to be a socialist experiment in the nationalisation of trade, something that was bound to end in government bungling and inefficiency. Um, so, not quite the same views about government intervention, but as I say, similar programmes of intervention. So, Frederick Hilgendorf, who we just met, is really the key figure in the New Zealand wheat industry. Um, and he begins making crossbreeding experiments in around 1910 at the University of Canterbury. Uh, and then in 1922, just after the quote that we saw, he goes to England and he works with Roland Biffin to learn the new Mendelism. Um, and he develops a wheat breeding program when he comes back to New Zealand which is a very conscious mimicry of what's happening in Britain. So he focuses on strength, on producing uh, thicker straw to allow mechanised harvesting. Um, and he does this in a very similar context. So he's allied with a university and he establishes the Wheat Research Institute. And all along, he makes arguments as to why this should be government-funded. Um, this is a matter for scientific experiment extending over a long series of years before results can be verified and a strain definitely established. It is properly a matter for government enterprise. Um, so, the Wheat Research Institute that he establishes has a somewhat different purpose to the Institute in Britain. Um, and this is the uh, mission statement, to be a little anachronistic of the Institute. Um, it was founded, they say, to improve yield and quality of wheat grown in New Zealand, to improve the flour and bread made from this wheat. But note, it belongs to the farmers, millers and bakers, and is administered by the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, another institute which was directly named after the British equivalent. Um, and the funding came from a series of levies uh, which were directly taken from trade bodies. And this is quite a difference to what was happening in Britain. Um, so in a sense the trades were keeping the institute more honest. Um, in a way that became problematic for Otto Frankel. Um, so you might recognise Otto Frankel here. Um, very much later in his career. Um, he's very much more famous now for his uh, theory of the origins of biodiversity, um, something that was a love letter really to Babylon, uh, published in books such as this. Um, but today I want to look at a very much younger Otto Frankel. Uh, and he was a man described in his obituary as a geneticist by training, a plant breeder by occupation, a cytologist by inclination, and a genetic conservationist by acclaim. So it's those two uh, central parts that I want to look at most today, a plant breeder by occupation and a cytologist by inclination. So uh, Otto Frankel, uh, to give some background, he was born in Vienna in 1900. Uh, he studied at the same gymnasium as Karl Popper, and he collaborated with Popper uh, later in life. Um, and then uh, he did a stint in Palestine, uh, working with the Empire Marketing Board, um, and he came back to Britain afterwards and worked with Roland Biffin. Um, so Biffin was very much impressed with Frankel, and he secured him the job at the Wheat Research Institute as the institutional plant breeder. Um, Frankel arrived in 1927 in New Zealand and he brought with him a, a handful of seeds from Biffin and A.E. Watkins, uh, the cytologist 
who described the number of chromosomes in wheat first. Um, so working in New Zealand, uh, Frankel amassed around 11,000 varieties and started crossbreeding experiments between them. Um, And he also started looking at various testing systems, uh, contrasting chessboard sampling with the American row rod system. And he also made several um, innovations in genetic plant breeding. So Frankel was really the person who pioneered backcrossing. Um, this is absolutely standard now in uh, histories of genetics and genetics textbooks, but it's surprising that it came in quite so late. Um, and backcrossing really functions like this. Um, one simply backcrosses the offspring with the parental type again and again and again. And initially, the Wheat Research Institute's uh, paymasters in government seem to have been very happy with this. Uh, so they proclaimed um, the result of this investigation will be of importance to the whole empire. So Frankel thought he was in quite a good position. Um, and he went to them and he said, well, can I do some cytological work now? And time and time again, he was told he couldn't. Um, so he had to really fight even to get a microscope at the Institute. Um, and instead, what they wanted him to do was produce new varieties. Um, and Frankel was very successful in doing this. Uh, so he produced a variety called Cross 7 and another one called Hilgendorf. You can really see how much he was trying to impress. Um, and both of them were as successful as Biffin's varieties in Britain. Um, he also became involved in seed testing. But his approach was to draw up procedures which were then distributed to farmers who would do the certification and the stock control themselves. So, instead of centralising the process, he was very sure to decentralise it and take that work away from his remit. Um, in 1932, uh, Frankel took a tour of the European Plant Breeding Institutes. And we can really see the view of um, a homesick European going back to his own territory. Um, and the thing that he really took away from that tour wasn't any particular plant breeding technique, but a particular ethos about the organisation of research. Um, so this is a really interesting quote. Uh, the coordination of fundamental and applied work is the most essential condition for the success of the latter, not only by reason of the applicability of theoretical results to the economic work, but even more for the sake of the stimulus which fundamental research exerts on the worker himself. Um, so you can really see a longing here to be doing some fundamental research. Um, and he continues, uh, all institutions with important economic results to their credit are also leading in terms of fundamental research. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the isolation of the research workers in New Zealand is a very serious handicap to their work. Um, he felt that he was missing out on flows and exchanges of seed products and materials. So, as I've said, Frankel was quite successful, but not in getting time or money to do the research that he wanted to. So after the release of Cross 7 and Hilgendorf, he went on to become the director of the Wheat Research Institute. Um, but just as he came to a position of power, the Wheat Research Institute was realigned and amalgamated into the Department of Agronomy. Um, five years later, he then became the director of the Department of Agronomy. Um, but still, he couldn't convince his bosses that the cytological work that he wanted to do, which was very much uh, a kind of ancestor to Darlington's work at the JAI, um, was worth paying the money for. Um, so, in 1951, after just a year as director, he quit the job. Um, in a massive argument about pensions and pay rates, um, he went to Australia. And there he started working uh, for the Commonwealth Institute of Scientific Research and he established a phytotron. Um, so a phytotron is a kind of equivalent to the cyclotrons uh, 
which were being developed in the period. Um, and the idea is to produce a hermetically sealed biotic environment. Uh, so one in which all external factors can be excluded and pure fundamental research can be done. Um, just to close off that story of Frankel, uh, when he arrives in Australia, uh, a month later, is invited to join the Royal Society in London by uh, correspondence, but at least he finds that uh, community. Okay, so uh, to conclude, what I think we've got in uh, all three papers today um, are a, a similar series of factors being instantiated in different ways. Um, so this is kind of a very minimal list of those factors. There are obviously many more. Um, I think the international wheat markets really frame what's happening in Italy, Britain, and New Zealand, um, and elsewhere. Um, and there's a particular political economy and moral economy in place in each country. And this is expressed through those particular views of national security and food security, um, which emerge in Britain and are replicated in New Zealand. Um, and there are also commercial interactions, um, not just between commercial firms who are utilising the new Mendelian insights, but between Mendelian breeders who are reaching out and producing their own commercial varieties. And as we saw in Dom's paper and we'll see in Luca's paper, um, there's a move towards seed testing and regulation, which seems to accompany um, this professionalisation of academic breeders. Um, and I think the other thing that all three papers point out very nicely is that genetics was always big science, um, not necessarily well funded, but widely geographically distributed. Um, but it was ge geopolitically and geographically diverse. Um, and I think, uh, uh, I think a more developed history of genetics uh, would do justice to those national contexts and the projects which were occurring in them. So realigning our perspective to look at Britain and New Zealand rather than Britain and America gives a rather different view of cytological work. Um, it's not a question of cytology winning out, it's a question of cytology being suppressed. Um, okay, and that's where I was. Thanks very much.